Um, all right, so uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, life safety. Um, as per usual, we're going to start at, at 10 o'clock, uh, which is uh, just in a couple of minutes' time. Um, so, yeah, wh what did we talk about last week? Uh, was it, yeah, different, was it different types of, um, of uh, sprinkler setup? Um, so, yeah, we looked at uh, wet alarm valves, dry alarm valves, pre-action, uh, alternate systems, um, all those different types of, of sprinkler installation that you can have. Um, today we're looking at life safety sprinkler systems and kind of what do we mean by uh, life safety and what are the kind of the key differences between a property protection sprinkler system and a life safety sprinkler system. That's what we're going to be uh, covering today. So it, it, it's quite a good one. Um, um, when I'm dealing with um, sort of complex um, I mean, all, all of um, Project Fire's products are, not all, but you know, a lot of them are based around life safety projects because of the additional complexity that that brings. Uh, property protection uh, systems tend to be uh, more simple. Uh, they're often sort of larger in terms of the actual um, square meterage being covered. Um, but it's a, in terms of complexity, um, life safety systems are, 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 are more complex. Um, so yeah, but that's, um, that's one of the things we're going to be looking at today. So I, I think it, I think it is ten o'clock now. So um, let's uh, let's let's get a start. So obviously these are going to be based upon uh, UK um, sprinklers, and in particular 12845 and the technical bulletins that accompany the LPC uh, rules for um, sprinkler installations. Um, so yeah, life safety in different countries is going to mean uh, slightly different things, and there's going to be um, different requirements, um, but all are kind of got the same idea, I guess. So life safety buildings then, um, so they might be um, residential. Um, so there's an example of a, a residential building. Now that would be um, normally uh, installed to either BS9251 or BS16259. Um, if the building is, is over 18 meters, then it's gonna have to be uh, 9251. Um, but up until that point, you've got a choice between uh, the two at the moment. Um, and so both of those standards make it quite clear, you know, they are life safety standards. You know, they're not designed to be property protection in any way. So if it's a residential building, it, it's kind of life safety by default. Um, under 12845, then we have um, lots of property protection applications. Um, it could be warehouses, factories. Um, it could be things like offices, etc., uh, where, you know, it is there for property protection, um, but it's public buildings which are, um, say, the vast majority of those will be sprinkler protected for life safety. So, for an example, a hospital, um, yeah, it, it's, the sprinklers are there for, for life safety and not property protection. Um, so, what is the difference? Um, it's really the difference is down to what the purpose of the sprinkler system is is there for. So, uh, you know, is it there to protect the building, to protect the stock, to protect the business, or is it there to protect the people uh, inside the building? In terms of actually what happens, um, is very very similar. You know, uh, sprinkler heads will be heat activated, water will be discharged, alarms will sound. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, uh, exactly the same thing. Um, but for life safety, what we're actually trying to achieve is safe uh, evacuation from the building. Um, so we're looking to, you know, so, so yes, we're looking to extinguish the fire. That'll be brilliant. Um, but really, it's to do with keeping um, the kind of exits clear, keeping the smoke to a minimum, um, and, and just get, giving people extra time um, by suppressing the fire, giving the people inside the building more time to evacuate. Um, so that, those are the kind of the, the main uh, sort of differences. Also, it's to do with who's in charge of the sprinkler system. So for property protection, it's kind of an insurance thing. Um, it, you know, it, it, the insurance company are there, kind of in charge, if you like, of the sprinkler system. 
for when it's life safety, it's going to be other stakeholders um, and the building owner, uh, the person that's kind of running the building. So, for example, in, in, in a hospital situation, it would be kind of government, councils, uh, the NHS trusts, um, you know, people like that will be actually looking at the life safety of that building, obviously as a whole, and the sprinklers will be part of that. So a summary of life safety requirements. So life safety is a term that um, uh, we, you know, we use quite readily. Um, it actually w was renamed a, a few years ago. Um, so it's actually now uh, officially it's called uh, additional measures to improve system reliability and availability. So that, that's kind of it, it's, its full title, if you like, um, but we still use uh, life safety as, um, as the, um, the kind of quick, quick term, I suppose, to, to call it that. Um, and, but yeah, the long, the long name really does describe exactly what it's all about. It's additional measures to improve system reliability and availability. OK, so if the sprinklers are, are activated, you want them to, to work well um, and want them to, to be work reliably. Um, obviously, we want that for property protection as well. But for life safety, we want to put additional measures in place. So what do we do? So first of all, we want to use wet insulation. Um, so, yeah, we want to use the, the wet type, uh, which we talked about last week. Um, so that there's water at the heads um, immediately when they're, when they're activated. Um, so it gets a little bit complicated in terms of, um, you know, what, what have you got? If you've got a life safety building with, with, with a car park. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you can do that, of course. Um, the car park is like a separate installation. Um, some, you know, I have seen, you know, lots of dry um, installations installed. Um, so, so there's a little, kind of a little bit of a grey area there. But, you know, we want to use wet wherever possible, definitely for, for life safety. Uh, life safety systems are zoned systems. Um, and that should be zoned in accordance with Annex D, which I'll go through in a minute. We want to use quick response sprinkler heads. So, you know, a different type of sprinkler head is used. Um, th these are some of the key differences, by the way. You know, there's not ev absolutely every single difference. Um, there's a difference in the alarm valves and the way that they are active during maintenance. Um, we need to increase the reliability of the water supply. Um, and then there's additional precautions for lockdowns. So it's not lockdowns, <laughs> got lockdowns on the brain, shutdowns. Um, so yeah, th those are kind of six, six key points I want to go through uh, in today's presentation. So wet, in wet insulation types we know all about anyway. So let's look at uh, what Annex D says. So this is Annex D of 12845. Um, so yeah, by the way, um, life safety is Annex F of uh, 12845. So Annex F kind of lists what the requirements for life safety is and then refers on to Annex D. So Annex D, uh, this is all about zoning. So a life safety system must be zoned. A property protection system can be zoned. So it's basically you know, an optional thing. Um, most property protection systems are not zoned or unzoned is, is what we, you know, a more common way of saying it. Um, why would you zone a property protection system? Um, because you can then give obviously greater flexibility in terms of shutting parts of it down. It also means that you can increase the total um, area that one alarm valve protects, which you know is it, not a big deal really because you could just put another installation in, in, in there. But say so, so most property protection systems are unzoned. Life safety systems must be zoned. So let's start um, So looking at a few things here. So zoned insulation shall not include any hazard greater than OH3. So OH is ordinary hazard uh, and then ordinary hazard group 3. So there is ordinary hazard group 4 and then there's also high hazard application. So it kind of makes sense really. Um, life safety systems therefore must be no greater than OH3. So that's kind of interest, interesting kind of um, uh, an interesting kind of way the, in which the rules have, have writ, been written. So Annex F is a, is a life safety standard. Like the, Annex F does not say that the highest um, hazard category is OH3, 
but it does say zone in accordance with Annex D, and Annex D says that OH3 is the highest. So, you know, so it, there's, a, there's a few examples of that where um, it's actually that the life safety annex doesn't actually tell you what to do, it just refers you on to other places. So that makes sense, you know, we don't want um, life safety and high hazard uh, processes or storage going on, you know, it's kind of one or the other really. Uh, sprinkler protected throughout on all floors, so that, that's important. Um, for life safety, you know, we don't want to pick and choose and say, yeah, we're going to sprinkler protect that bit, but not that bit. You know, we want to sprinkler protect everywhere um, so that, you know, no matter where the fire starts, we kind of got it covered. Uh, then each, each zone of this zoned system, it has a monitored isolation valve. Uh, they call it a zone subsidiary stop valve in the uh, in the standards, but yeah, I call it a zone valve, but you could call it an, a monitored isolation valve. So that, that's key, it's monitored, so it's got a tamper switch on it, it's got wires coming out of it, which tells you when the, the valve is not fully open. And again, that, that's kind of a, uh, you know, note the way that I've said that. It doesn't tell you when the valve is closed, it tells you when the valve is not fully open. So as you start to close it, you know, once you kind of do like, you know, uh, sort of half a turn or something, then, you know, you, you will get a signal. Um, each zone has a water flow detector, generally speaking, a flow switch immediately downstream of the zone valve. So the zone valve and the flow switch kind of go hand in hand, uh, and that's what kind of marks the start of each sprinkler zone. There shouldn't be any sprinkler heads that are not part of a zone. Um, so you're going to have, you know, kind of a long, potentially, you know, a long piece of pipe going from the uh, insulation control valve with no sprinkler heads on it. And then you're going to have your zone valve, your flow switch, and then all of the heads from there. Um, so so that, that's, again, that, that's kind of thing to important. No sprinkler heads should operate without a flow switch zoned sprinkler, the flow switch of the zone activating. So there's, there's heads prior to the flow switch, then obviously if they activate, the flow switch isn't going to activate. So all the heads need to be past that, that flow switch. Um, flushing valve required, um, and then a test facility uh, to, to, to test the flow switch. So test facility for flow switches should simulate one sprinkler head in operation. So that again, that's quite a key, a key uh, aspect um, that when we we're going to do our flow switch testing, we want to make sure that it picks up one head in operation. I've shown you the statistics of sprinklers in the past. So, you know, it, it's certainly not uncommon just to have one sprinkler head activating. And also from a kind of practical point of view, if there's water being discharged out of one head, you want to know about it. So, you know, the, the flow switch needs to be uh, sensitive to one sprinkler head. And when we're testing, we want to test one sprinkler head in operation. And as you probably know by now, we sell a product called Zone Check, which is a, an automated flow switch testing device, which absolutely tests to one sprinkler head in operation. Um, also in Annex D, we talk about this bypass arrangement on the alarm valve. Um, so again, we'll come on to that in a bit more detail later. Um, this is looking at maximum areas of protection. So first of all, um, table 17 of 12845 talks about the maximum size of unzoned installations. Okay, so that, that's table 17 say, is, is, I'm not going to go through that today, but that tells you that. If you're going to zone it, then the maximum floor area uh, per insulation control valve um, is 12,000 square meters. Um, so it's a good look, got to be careful here because we've got two numbers that look quite similar. Um, we've got 12,000 and 120,000. Um, so 120,000 is the maximum fl total floor area per insulation control valve. Okay, now that is higher than the figure in table 17. Okay, so we're, we're increasing the, 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 the total floor area that one control valve can, can, uh, can cope with, and no more than 12,000 square meters per floor. So um, to kind of max it out, you could have 10 floors of 12,000 square meters, which would add up to a total of 120,000 square meters. And then if you've got more area to protect, 
that's no problem. We just need to add in an another um, alarm valve, another installation control valve to then protect some more of that area, which say it is not really a big deal. Um, in Annex D, it talks about the maximum protective floor area per zone. Okay, so we're now we're, we're not talking about installation control valves now, we're talking about the zones that are on those control valves. Okay, so maximum area total, 120,000, um, maximum area per floor, 12,000, and then we can split that 12,000 up into maximum of six. So, you know, two zones is, is the minimum amount of zones we can have um, if we're, we're kind of going for, for 12,000 square meters. Okay, however, okay, so I'm going to put here, but, okay, that is the rule as far as Annex D is concerned. So what that's really talking about is property protection. A zoned property protection system, the maximum is 6,000. When it comes to life safety, we look at Annex F and it tells us actually we're going to look at 2,400 square metres as the maximum uh, floor area per zone. Okay, and again, that the way it's written, um, it, it's written in a more um, direct manner in the in the technical bulletins. But yeah, the fact that it's talking about floor area kind of gives you a hint that no no zone should should go over more than one floor. Okay, so you know we can't have you know half half of the zone on one floor and then half of the zone on another. It doesn't work that way. Okay, so maximum areas. Um, so basically, small. You know, we want to split the system up into small chunks. Um, the reason being is then we, we get more information about where an activation has taken place. Uh, obviously, the, you know, the more zones we've got, then basically the, 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 the more information we've got in terms of where exactly did that activation take place. And the more um, areas we have so that when we, we have a problem, when we have maintenance, when we want to do a shutdown, we can just close one um, zone valve and we can sort out that that problem without affecting the whole the rest of the place. So that, that's kind of the whole idea of why we, we zone uh, a life safety system. Um, so additionally, uh, TB229314, that, that kind of gives a specific sort of an additional uh, rule as far as uh, zoning um, and life safety is concerned. Um, it says each floor of a multi-story building must have at least one zone and no single zone should encompass more than one ownership or tenancy. So it's spelling it out quite clearly. You can't have a zone split between two different floors, even if you've got two very small floors, you can't, you can't do that. And also very importantly, uh, no single zone should encompass more than one ownership or tenancy. Okay, so if you've got um, an office building where you've got different clients on different floors, then each tenant should have their own flow switch, which yeah, do, does make practical sense. Um, for example, if, if one office, um, one tenancy, you know, they kind of they move, move office, so you've got you know, a little break, another, another company's coming in, they want to um, sort of refit the office, they need to turn the sprinklers off. Well, it's a bit unfair, isn't it, of the, the office on the other side of the, the, the floor, um, which are, you know, are actually trying to work in there, um, and then they would have to turn off their sprinkler protection if it was just one zone per floor. Um, but as it is, you know, you can turn off um, the, the kind of the unoccupied area whilst you're doing a, a refit and, you know, the area that is, um, that is still kind of operational working, they can have a, their fully working sprinkler system. So, yeah, that's something to, important to bear in mind. Uh, and, and, yeah, often, you know, we don't get anywhere near the, uh, the kind of the limit for um, size of zone because we kind of fall under this, this ownership or tenancy thing first. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk about um, uh, quick response sprinkler heads. Uh, we have mentioned this um, when I did my sprinkler heads part one, um, we, we, did, we could mention this. So your RTIs, response time indexes, um, that is kind of how quickly the head operates. Um, and it's also the, the way that we control that is we just have a, a smaller bulb for the quick response than we do for the larger, um, for the standard response head. So we've got two heads there. One's, the one on the left there is a quick response. The one on the right is a standard response. And so I don't, I don't really want to say any more on that today because of time. Uh, and, so, and also I'm, I'm aware that I've already kind of covered some of this uh, in previous presentations. 
And that was, again, just a reminder about this, this fast response and quick response. Just, just be careful because they don't, they don't really mean the same thing. Quick response is what we're after. Fast response is, is down, basically down to the bulb. Quick response is like the, the total amount of time it will take to, um, to, to activate. Okay, so we've looked at three of our six sort of key things for live safety. We looked at um, wet insulation type, the zoning, and the quick response heads. So we're going to be looking at the alarm valves, the water supply, and the shutdowns um, coming up. So the a life safety alarm valve then. So this picture here is another one of the, the products that um, Project Fire sell. Um, this is called a fire pod. Uh, they come in different sort of varieties. We have ones for sprinkler zones. We also have them for um, alarm valves. So here we have... Um, the alarm valve, if you can see my, my mouse. Um, so that's sort of the big kind of red lump in, in the middle on the right hand side, that is uh, the alarm valve. We have our bell check unit installed, which is the um, sort of little circulating unit using the two green MECTs. Um, that is there to test the alarm valve um, without discharging any water, uh, making it really simple and easy. So it's another one of our, of our products. So it's like a product in the product uh, for us. It's a bell check within a fire pod. Um, and the, you know, the main difference for life safety is we have this now, we have this bypass line on the left-hand side. So what, what we're not seeing here is two installations. It's one installation with a bypass. You can see the arrow at the top there, that's going off into um, to feed all the pipes and, and all the different zones. Um, but yeah, it's a, there's only one outlet from this fire pump. The water coming in um, can go in from the left or the right, but in this case, I've got it coming in from the left. And then you can connect um, other fire pods together and say additional installations. And then there's a drain coming out the side there. So we have some valves. Um, two, sorry, yeah, one above the alarm valve, one below and then the bypass line. So the, 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 the valves above and below the, um, the alarm valve are normally open and the bypass line is normally closed, okay? So 99% of the time, the water is gonna take this route here, okay? Well, 99% of the time, the water's not gonna go anywhere, um, but in the event of a fire, then the water is gonna take this route through the alarm valve and up into the system. However, you know, the, the problem comes is that when we want to service the alarm valve, and that, that happens fairly regularly, you know, we want to kind of get in there, clean it out, um, replace, um, there's like a rubber seal around, which, which needs um, messing with. Um, so yeah, we, we need to do some maintenance on our alarm valve. Um, and that is where the bypass line comes in. Because without it, we, we'd have to shut the sprinkler system off. Well, that insulation anyway, we'd have to close these, these valves um, in order to strip out the alarm valve without getting very wet. So, we, so we, it renders the sprinkler system a little bit useless, really. So we have this, when we want to do some maintenance, we, we close the valves above and below the alarm valve so we can get into it, but we actually open the bypass line, which means that the water can now flow this way and through and into the system. Okay, now there's no alarm valve on there, so we, we, we've kind of lost some of the functionality, we've lost some of the signaling, um, but, you know, we're only going to be um, doing the maintenance for a short period of time. Um, you know, there, there's guys on site um, whilst that's going on. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's not a problem for a short period of time to, to, to make use of this bypass line. The most important thing is the sprinklers are on uh, and active. Um, and yeah, the other option is to have a twin alarm valve. So you li literally have two alarm valves, one either side. They're both serving the same installation. So one alarm valve basically has quite a lonely existence and doesn't really do anything um, until you're maintaining the other one. And then um, it, it kind of has a, has a purpose. Um, that's obviously a, an extra cost. Uh, Say so it's not generally required um, and therefore Typically, we just have a bypass line instead of a twin uh, alarm valve. Okay. So moving on, let's look at the water supplies. 
Um, so as I mentioned in the um, on the slide there, that there are uh, we have Annex F to look, look at, but we also have TB um, two two four and three three six. That there are two. That I'll, I'll look in a minute. That there's two technical bulletins which also refer to um, water supplies for um, life safety. So you know you need to kind of look at all three of them together to kind of get the full picture. But in essence, you've got a choice. Um, you can either have a superior twin or a twin. Okay, so this is a superior twin water supply. We have uh, a tank here, uh, which is split down the middle. So we have one full capacity tank that's split into two halves, and we have two pumps, and each pump has access to both halves of the tank. Um, so we've got um, a primary pump, which typically electric pump. We've got a backup pump, which could be a secondary electrical pump or a diesel pump. Um, and you see the electrical pump can see both sides of the, the half capacity tank, well, two half capacity tanks. So the electrical pump's got 100% water available. The diesel pump has got 100% water available. Um, the reason why it's split into two is because if we have a leak on the tank or if we need cleaning out or some kind of process like that, then we can just isolate one half of the water supply and we've still got the other half. So it, it, you know, definitely better than nothing. So most of the time we're only going to be using you know, a, a few sprinkler heads. Um, so generally speaking, the tank is, is very much oversized uh, for what we need. Um, but obviously we're planning for the worst case scenario. Um, so we can, we can, for a very short time, uh, we can close off half of the tank um, and do some work on that. So that's a superior twin, okay? So it's better than a superior supply, okay? Because we, we're kind of splitting the tank in two and we've got, we've got two pumps. Um, but it's not quite as good as a twin supply. So it kind of fits in the middle. That's why it's called superior twin. It's better than superior. It's not quite as good as twin. Um, there's an example there. So we've got our, our sectional tank in the background there, which is, say, split in half. And then we have our two two pumps that are both drawing um, from either side. Well, they can both see both sides of that tank. The alternative is a duplicate or a twin water supply. So duplicate and twin, so they kind of mean the same thing. So here we have two full capacity tanks. OK, so the tanks aren't joined together. They, they, they could be sort of physically next to each other. Um, but um, yeah, th this one's showing two completely separate tanks and each one is 100% water of, of capacity. And they have two tank, we have two pumps, sorry. And again, there's no need to connect these together because both pumps have got their own water supply. So you can see from this way, um, it, is, it is better. Um, it is a lot more space required, you know, in terms of uh, the actual water storage. Um, but yeah, the, the, the duplicate or the twin supply is, you know, the ultimate really um, supply that we can have. But as I say, cost, space restrictions, often, you know, we go for a superior twin for life safety, but the other option is the duplicate or twin supply. Okay, so we, we're kind of ticking these off now. So that, that's what I was talking about with the water supply. Look at TB233 and 224. Um, I think I got those wrong earlier on. So yeah, TB233 and TB224 in, in um, as well as Annex F, and you'll get kind of the full picture of uh, water supplies, so which can be a bit confusing. Um, so finally, then, we're looking at uh, additional precautions for shutdowns. So um, a shutdown, say, can either be um, a planned shutdown or an unplanned shutdown. So an unplanned shutdown basically is a, is a fire. Um, in a fire, we're going to have heads going off, um, and then once the, the fire is dealt with, then we're going to be turning the sprinkler system off um, whilst we kind of reset it, replace sprinkler heads, tidy up, all that kind of stuff. That's an unplanned shutdown, um, which, say, in most of the time is because the sprinkler system's come on and done a really good job, um, and so, you know, it's it's kind of a, a good thing really that that it's shut down for that point. A planned shutdown, as the name suggests, is where we're actually thinking, okay, we want to do something. So it might be we need to add a zone. Um, we we found something's broken, needs repairing. Maybe we've got a leak. Maybe we want to do some some testing. 
Um, so a lot of many reasons why I want to do a planned shutdown. Um, but the, the thing here is that we you know, we need to take this quite seriously. You know, um, we're actually turning off all or part of a sprinkler system. So it, it, it is kind of a big deal. So with Annex F, it makes the point here, we want to turn off the smallest part of the installation necessary. So, you know, again, with, with, our, with our idea of zoning, you know, we should just be able to turn off a small part of the system to in order to carry out that, that work. So, yeah, a bit of thought required there. Also, Annex J and uh, TB203.6, they lay out kind of lots of um, kind of things to consider, um, such as Firewatch, such as, you know, informing the insurer, um, checking everything else is working before you, um, before you actually turn anything off. Um, you know, there are lots of additional precautions that, to, to be placed, put in place before um, a plan shutdown um, it goes ahead. Yeah, you know, because say it, it, it's a serious business. You know, it, the, the sprinkler system is there to do a job. If you're turning it off, then there are some some uh, some kind of re repercussions really that need to be thought through. Um, you know, in fact, like like informing um, people. Um, so if you're a shopping centre and you're shutting down a part of the system, should the public be in that space? Um, arguably, no. Um, you could, uh, as long as you've kind of put other measures in place. Um, you know, if, if you've got tenants, have you informed them that that's what's going on? Yeah, there's quite a few bits in there um, to kind of. So yeah, the point is, I'm waffling here. That the point is, shutdowns are you know are important. Um, they're, they're off, you, know, you, you can't help them plan shutdowns. There is always going to be things that need doing, but they need to be taken seriously and um, yeah, fully planned through to make sure that everything is in place before we, we shut down. And when we do shut down, we're shutting down the smallest part necessary to actually carry out the works. OK, that's it for today. Um, so Sprinkler Heads part two is, is next week. Um, so yeah, we'd, we've already done part one. Um, so part two is going to be looking at other aspects of, of Sprinkler Heads. And so I'm hoping that there'll be some, some kind of uh, video or, or kind of demonstration to show you uh, the head sort of fully working. I see if we'll see what I can do um, for that one. Okay, so hope you found that useful, and enjoyable. Um, just going to check if there's any questions. Don't know whether you can hear my kids shouting in the background. Okay, can't see any questions, so uh, yeah, I will uh, I'll go and uh, sort out whatever's happening in my living room. Uh, so yeah, um, see you next week. Bye.